We've had a number of potential nannies come through already. Do you think you can manage? Of course. I'm Malcolm. Hi. I'm the grocery boy. Well, grocery man. <laughs> Lead the way. Allow me to introduce Mr. Hilter. And this is our son, Ross. <laughs> Music gives him so much joy. Brahms is not like other children. It is very important that you follow these rules. Be good to him and he'll be good to you. No offense, Brahms, but you kind of creep me out. someone else to see it. To see what? If you leave him alone, they don't give you a sign. This is like some kind of magic trick, right? It's not a trick. Tell me about the real Brahms. He was downright strange. A little girl from town used to come out here to play with Brahms. They found her body in the woods. By the time the police arrived, the place was up in flames. Brahms didn't make it out. Hello? No one's been out there for years. You wouldn't hurt me, would you, Brahms? It's not safe in this house. You don't understand what's happening. He's alive. Good to him, won't you? Rupert, thanks so much for being here. Not at all. It's great to be here. Look at you guys. Thanks for being here too. Rupert, big, uh, big time for you right now. Not just the boy, a number of other projects that you have going on, but the boy. What the what is going on? I know it's kind here? of it's kind of scary. Isn't yeah. It? yeah, yeah. But what Good. was it like for you acting alongside a terrifying doll? <laughs> It's kind of weird because he kind of became the lead actor, this kind of doll that couldn't really say anything, but was there every day and, you know, was a, a big part of every scene. It's kind of and weird. And just like any other actor, I'm sure he had like a PA to usher him on and <laughs> off set and stuff as well. He was demanding. There was actually, the truth of it is, that there was, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure I can tell you. There were three dolls, actually. So, there, there, you know, you'll see uh, there was three of them and they would... They would be stored, the, the, the boy, the doll, would be stored in these kind of coffins. And we would arrive every morning in these kind of <laughs> weird kind of coffins. It was kind of bizarre. The coffin opens and the doll yeah, just arises. Yeah, yeah, like, like that. And, and Brahms would be taken out and we would then do the scenes with these dolls. Why so. three different dolls? Do they have different facial expressions, like slight do modifications? You know, tiny. Yeah. There are tiny modifications in each doll. Uh, you know, uh, like, like the human face, no face is symmetrical. And so they were very... They were very keen to try and uh, replicate, um, you know, the doll's face as, as human-like as possible. So I think in one, one eye is slightly bigger or, you know, I think there's a slight uh, change of facial expressions in one other doll. But a lot of it was done with lighting and camera movements, you know. Well, that's such an interesting decision to have to make uh, for the director to decide early on which faces he's going to, I mean, he's probably going to choose three before you start shooting, and so he has to decide, like, what the three specific yeah, and expressions actually, are And actually, I couldn't be. even tell. Do you know what I mean? Because really? a lot, a, the doll, Brahms, the dolls seem to change expression with the lighting. You wouldn't believe right. it. They're kind of, you know, different lighting. If the light was, you know, taken from the side or from behind, it would take on a different kind of character. It was Did the doll crazy. take on an effect for you where, like, you probably didn't want to mess with it at all or, like, screw <laughs> around with, like, like, pick it up in between scenes, like, oh, Brom, piece of shit. Like, well, people did muck thing. around. You know, people would move, really? move him, and then I'd be like, you know, and suddenly it would be kind of happening. I would, be, it was I, really I would start weird. doing that, and then it would feel like, like, like it could be possessed, really, and I'd be like, I'm going to actually just put this down just in case. It's probably not, but I don't really want to mess with it. Sort of move his arm a bit, like, hi. <laughs> you know, like, kind of crazy. You walk yeah. into a room, and the doll's alone in the room, and it's just, I bet it's actually kind of creepy. <laughs> I, think, I think Lauren certainly had a lot of scenes with, with the doll, and 
I think she kind of really struck up this kind of weird relation. It's very weird, you know, very weird. <laughs> and there's some real, there's a really big, you know, there's a couple of, although the trailer is, is great, they've, they've kind of saved the best f for the movie. There's a huge twist um, at, at the end of the movie, and uh, which, you know, when you see it, it, it's a real surprise, which they've held back, so you haven't seen that. So there's a lot more than... Yeah. The trailer gives away, which is great. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Was that what attracted you to doing this movie? That it wasn't just going to be a kind of horror movie about a doll? That it was going to have a very interesting uh, Yeah, twist? I mean, you know, I think this, this, this horror movie, as I said, it has a huge twist to it. And my character, you know, Malcolm, um, he, he isn't perhaps all he is, you know, he makes out to be. So that was certainly interesting uh, for me. And, and uh and, I, and I, I enjoyed it when I read it, so I, I just was, I was desperate to try and kind of work with the director who's done a few uh, great horror movies before, the, um, the Devil Inside and stuff, yeah, and Brent Williams. So yeah, so I was desperate to work with him, and that's really why. He did The Devil Inside. Uh, wasn't the, did that have anything to do with Guillermo del Toro, The Devil Inside, I thought? No. Or I think The Devil's Backbone. That's Devil's me. Backbone, that's the, yeah, that, yeah, That was yeah. actually one of, yeah, one of his yeah. movies. Yeah, although I, I did, I've done Hellboy with Guillermo del Toro. So, well, that's where, uh, you could, that's where so I was I, I leading kind of, into that. Yeah, with so the, I feel like, um, there's a bit of him in, 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 in all these horror movies. I and think. this is also um, this is a produced by a new company, SDX Entertainment. There's a big New Yorker profile about them about a, a week or two ago about this new sort of burgeoning movie studio. And they did a movie, The Gift, which was a totally. sort of another amazing t take on on a, a sort of familiar genre. Was that a movie that you had seen? That you sort of. Do you know what? I was in Seattle filming uh, and, and The Man in the High Castle. Actually, when I went to see that, The Gift, and um, it had another British actor friend, Dan Stevens, in it. So I went to see it. And again, I, I think uh, STX are doing a great job of trying to kind of finding these niche kind of movies, these horror movies, with, but are really well made and really take an audience, I think, on a, on a journey. I think it'll surprise you when you, when you do see it. Um, and it, it's, they're kind of very well shot. They look fantastic and very high-end production values. And I think, um, I, I, hope, you know, I hope people enjoy it, yeah. Now, when you go into a horror movie, do you think about portraying your, or acting for that genre? Or do you think, like any other project or like a drama, like a, just about your character and what your character is going to be going through and trying to make that as real as possible? Well, I think the key for me uh, with, with a good horror movie, as with any movie, is if the characters are credible. Because I think if people buy into the story um, and if they buy into the kind of uh, the characters and believe the characters, then I think they'll hopefully believe the, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the thriller, the sense of the, the horror of the piece. Um, so I think it's about the, the characters for me in the story, yeah. What's your uh, go-to horror movie, just out of curiosity? Uh, Cronus is probably Guillermo del Toro. Wow. is one of the uh, first ever, yeah. you know, one of his first ones. Although I, I you know, um, I, I love... Cronus is a good pick. It's, that's it's that's pretty, a solid... It's yeah. quite niche, but uh, I, I love that one. Um, and I love Pan's Labyrinth as well. I, I, you know, I, I, I enjoy yeah. that. I'm sure you, some of you guys have seen that. Um, but there's some, I've seen some kind of really, you know... In fact, a lot of Spanish. I've watched a couple of Spanish ones. Are you a fan good. of the genre, or I, you know what? I love a good horror movie. I love being scared. I love yeah. you know, and I you know, I love that kind of sense of being taken on a journey and being surprised. And I think a really good horror movie like this does that. So for absolutely, a, for I mean, the best you watch a, a good horror movie for the sake of being surprised. It starts somewhere, and you're not exactly sure where it's going to go. Exactly. A good horror movie, or you can be like me, and you can also just watch bad horror movies because they're they can be really funny, <laughs> <laughs> which I do quite well, regularly. You know, there's, there's an enjoyment watching a really bad one because just like you can laugh and have yeah. fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so right out of the gate, I mean, or, or pretty early on in your career, you got to work with Guillermo del Toro on on Hellboy. What yeah. was that like? Well, I you know I I just I just come out of drama school in in, in London and I you know I found myself uh, you know on a Guillermo del Toro set and doing a Hellboy. It was amazing. Ron Perlman and and John Hurt and Selma Blair. They were all amazing, and it was it was an incredible experience for me. Uh, we we shot most of it in Prague in the Czech Republic and in L.A. Um, and uh, to see this world that Guillermo had created and see this kind of creature Hellboy, who again had a real heart and soul to him and had a real story. And Ron, you know, it was it was amazing for me. It was a really amazing, a, amazing shoot. It was a hundred and sixty-seven day shoot. One hundred and sixty-seven. Yeah, it's one of the longest days. movies I've, 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 in fact, I've ever done. And it was. Was Man um, in the High Castle even that long? No, no, no. It was much less than that. Yeah. That's we, crazy. Yeah, it was huge. It was a huge kind of scale, you know, the, and the creatures that they had, you know, Guillermo had in that movie, and 
and the different kind of sets and the, and the it was just amazing to see it. And I feel like that would never happen now for an original property like a, I, a shoot I like agree. that. I mean, you know, and ha and talking to Guillermo, he, I don't think he's ever done another movie that long. You know, it took a lot out of him. Um, you know, he did all the Blade running before that and stuff. They weren't as long, but you know, for Ron Perlman who played Hellboy. You know, he, he did, I think he did it a hundred times, and it was a seven or eight hour makeup, in the, you know, and then a three hour takeoff. So it was a huge, huge thing for him. And uh, I used to sit Holy with him and watch him get, you know, because it was from, you know, from the waist up, really. And so for him, it was a huge undertaking, and uh, coming he did out an amazing of, job. Coming out of drama school, watching him every day, you know, three, you said three hour, three hour takeoff or six hour takeoff? Well, he, to put on... Three hours. Was, no, no, it was about six, That's five, insane. six, seven hours. And so and he then, would probably get started at like four, Oh, yeah, four, he would come in at like... He, his, his call time was like 3.15 in the morning. And then he wouldn't even get on set until about, you know, 11, 12 in the afternoon. And then he could morning. be shooting until like 10 o'clock at night. Well... It, or would they try to get him out of there? they try and get him out so, because of the turnaround time. So it was for him, it was, you know, really crucial. And also, Abe Sapium in that movie, Hellboy, also had even longer because he was full body prosthetics as well. He would literally sort of... Uh, he would kind of meditate um, for uh, Doug Jones, who who uh, who played him. Um, he's well, what did that teach you about patience? As not just as a as an actor in the craft, but as a person working in 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 this business. I'm yeah, sure it taught me that, that you know you, you you do a movie. Actually, ninety percent of the time is you spend waiting, and then actually you you know you, you ten percent is is the work, and it's about making sure that you're ready for when they call you because there can be a lot of waiting around. But that's you know that's part of the job. Ooh, and if they're if you're not ready when they call you, you're in trouble. The, you're in so you. much because they know that you've been waiting while they've yeah. been setting up for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's wow. about pitching it and making sure you you're ready, you know, physically as well as mentally for the scene. And yeah, it was kind of that movie was a real uh, eye opener for me because you know I, I was young then and I I really had no idea. And John Hurt particularly and really you know I was very lucky and took me under you know under his wing and really taught me how to how it all works I'd never been on a film set before I That's was incredible kinda, John Hurt I was kind of crazy crazy Wow what yeah. kind of what kind of advice did he give you well, He was you know he he was a veteran and he he is and I think he he taught me in fact the the greatest thing he said to me was you know play this you know the scene you're doing that day that moment is is the scene don't think about what's happened before or after just focus on being the moment in that scene like each scene is a mini movie he said right. And that's all that matters is the moment. Let the editor, when he edits the movie, let him worry about all the, all the rest of it about before and after. Just focus on the scene. And make that the director the focus on that. Yeah. Like if the director yeah. comes to you, maybe you should do this because before yeah. you were doing this, sure, yeah. modify, yeah. figure that out. But don't go into yeah. it constantly thinking about the overarching well, you know, narrative. Exactly. Just try and focus in the moment and be the moment. And I think that's, I, I've, that's always stayed with me. And, I, and I, you know, I, I, I use that every day for work. Absolutely, because then you would never be communicating what's going on with your character. You'd be trying to communicate the sort of author's idea of the whole story. Which and also, would... I, you know, over time, I realized that actually, you know, obviously the director is very important, but equally is the editor, you know, with the director. Editing a movie can make, a, make or break a movie, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's, I think it's the most underrated or, un, you know, sort of misunderstood job out of all of the jobs in film. And Have I you ever felt broken by editing? Well, you <laughs> no, but you, you kind of can <laughs> see the takes they use, and you kind of go, "Why did they use that take? I was much better," you know. But you, there are always reasons, you know. And so, an editor and a director, editing is is you know, it can change a whole, you know, they can change a whole story, you know, or take it out and change it. They can make people think or see a different, you know, different ideas and narratives. It's very powerful. Now, I have to ask you, we have to talk about this. You are one of the stars of Amazon's original series, Man in the High Castle, yeah. which is this incredible high concept based off the Philip K. Dick story uh, show that I believe is produced by, is it Scott Free that is producing? Yes, yeah, Scott Free. Right, um, Ridley, so Ridley Scott uh, has his hands in another project. Yeah. We had Josh Radner on here who was in a Ridley Scott mini miniseries, yeah, but yeah. they got their hands in this. And it's incredible. Incredible! It is one of the most oh, incredible, you, incredible things to just look at in regards to to television and and movies for that matter. What does it look like when you're shooting it? I'm curious how much of that is digital representation, is green screen, how much of that is actual physical production design that you can see around you while you're shooting. Well, I mean, for those of you, I don't know if any of you have seen it. it. It's you know, it's a Philip K. Dick novel. It's set in uh, in the 1960s in America, but it's just a twist, as as you know, it's set in. Uh, the idea is that the Nazis won World War II, so it's set in occupied America. So the Germans 
run the East Coast, the Nazis run the East Coast of America, and the Imperial Japanese, the West Coast. And so the, the TV show, as, as with the book, we, we focus, the stories are based in New York and in San Francisco, you know, in the 1960s. So for the show, it was a huge scope. Um, it's a period drama, it's got action, it's, you know, it's multi-genre. So it was a huge undertaking, I think. And, um, and the production values are, well, for me anyway, they're really high. And, you know, we, we tried to make it as, as cinematic as possible. But is that one of those things where every day you go focus on the scene, don't really like yeah, think about actually, all this? Yeah, but actually, you know, the, the, the money, you know, went into the sets and, you know, there's not a huge amount of CGI. I mean, you know, there is in terms of, you know, you can see the sort of the, the bridges in, in, in San Francisco but and it's stuff. In, but it's, um, it's very well done. Yeah, you know, you I see hope a lot so. of You see a lot it, of yeah. uh, period pieces now, be they movies or TV shows, and I think we're seeing a little bit more of them because of the abilities in, in CGI. But sometimes you can really see the creases, you know? Yeah. You can really see when the camera pulls back, okay, the green screen was about 20 feet back, and that's where, <laughs> you know, all, oh, of the, yeah. all of the landscapes are that they've yeah. built. Where with, with this, it's, it's, it's very well directed and very well designed so that what is... Obviously, CG, just because there's no way you could, you know, yeah. build those things or rebuild those things, looks very much a part of the practical landscape. Totally. And I think, you know, we, we shot it in Vancouver and we took up whole streets. I mean, it was amazing when we, you know, shot these scenes, these big street scenes with all these 1950s cars and all these supporting artists and, you know, walking around. And it was amazing when they kind of, you know, did these huge kind of set pieces and they spent a lot of time and, and, and money trying to really, because although it's set in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties, it, it's it's not the real nineteen sixties. If you know what I mean, it's a kind of version of the nineteen sixties. So, you know, Elvis didn't happen. Um, it's a music's it's a, different. So it's, it's a version of the nineteen sixties that weird. feels a little more nineteen fifties yeah. or nineteen forties, totally, right? So it's like totally. nineteen sixty two, but there's something about it that feels still sort of stuck in yeah. a. Yeah, and the in, and the detail of the design. You know, I I, I hope people. You know, really will appreciate it. Um, they we spent they spent hours trying to work out. You know, just little things like how tele public telephone booths would look. You know, there's a little if, if you see it in, in the show. Um, my character, I have this telephone in my apartment, and you there's a tiny a kind of telephone sign with a Nazi sign underneath it. It's a tiny little details. Um, that kind of really, I think, give give it an air of authenticity. You know, now, at this point, you're kind of a a, a veteran of, of movies and shows that have a certain amount of production value. When you first started doing it, and even when you step into Man in the High Castle, you see everything around you. Do you feel a certain amount of pressure as an actor? Do you worry about certain things that might be on your shoulders as the guy running the scene that's part of this vast production? <sighs> you know what? I, I when I was a little younger, I think I did. Um, but as time has gone on, I try to worry less about that stuff. Um, I, f for me, you know, if I if I think the idea is great and I love the character, then that's all I try and focus on. Because actually, as an actor, you know, there's only certain of things you you know you have control over, and that's your your story and your and that scene, and and the rest of it, you know, really you you don't. So I did I you know now I try and just focus on that and keep it simple if that makes any sense. but You, you know what's so interesting? Uh, going back to the, what John Hurt had said you, and I think this applies to the boy to a degree, is John Hurt telling you that focus on your scene, but what about when you're doing something like this that has such a twist in the end that you know is there, how hard is it for you not to be thinking about that twist? Yeah, that's kind of, it is hard. You're yeah. right, because you've obviously read the whole script, so you know, but it's about, I, you know, we, we, we try and just keep it, you know, n focused on the thing that this is what we're doing right now. I don't know about anything else and just trying to keep it simple. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult with his horror movies because you can just end up sort of running around, ha, ah! you know, <laughs> and actually, you know, it, you, there's, there's got to be a reason. Do you know what I mean? And I think good horror movies, like The Boy, you know, they, uh, th there's a real intensity and a believability to, to each scene, I hope. I hope. Oh, there, there is, so, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, so, they, you know, you just try and block block the end out and let, and let the story unfold and let the editor and director kind of worry about that. 100%. I think we have some time for uh, audience questions. Do you have any questions out there? Who's got some questions out here in the audience? Hi. Hi. So I just have to say that doll is creepy as hell. Like, it is, isn't it? Watching that trailer, I was like, oh my God. And I was like, thanking God that it wasn't a clown because you would have seen me in the fetal position rocking back and forth calling <laughs> for my mother because, oh my God. 
Well, so, that's good because that's what we. I think that's what we. That's what we hope. That's what we hope. Yeah, well, it's working. So, um, I wanted to know, what are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? Yes. Oh my God. Um, God. That's a really good question. Uh, Auditions. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, New Yorkers running around. <laughs> Everyone walks so quickly easy, here. Easy, Everyone bro. walks so quickly here. Uh, the cold. I, I've just come from somewhere a little warmer, and uh, I, I didn't bring a coat, and I'm freezing. Um, but I don't know. I, I, as a kid, I, I, I really didn't like the dark, if I'm really honest. It's taken me a long time to get used to that. So the dark, and I, and I get quite claustrophobic, and uh, so I'm not a fan of that, I have to say. I've been stuck in a few cupboards. I've done a few horror movies now where I've been stuck in really tight, I don't like it, tunnels. I've done a lot of tunnels. I did a movie called The Canal, where I was stuck in these tunnels for days, and I hated it. How, um, do, you, how do you deal with that uh, on set? Because I would imagine you're stuck in this thing that you don't like, you're uncomfortable, but coverage has to be gotten. Yeah. Takes have to be done. Have you ever found yourself in a moment where you're, just get it! Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just uncomfortable. <laughs> but just, like, kind of... Yeah. I have shouted, you know, a couple, there's been a couple of times on movies where I've just said... Okay, you've got one more, and then that, yeah. that, is, that is it. Come on, you know. So, yeah, there has been a few times like and that. And, like, yeah. you're, you're, you're hoping to God that I, you have a director who's, like, totally know where he's coming from. One more, we're going to get this. You <laughs> like, know what? I, I've got a lucky job. So, I, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I think um, if the director wants you to do it, you just got to do it, really. But, yeah. Next question. Hi, Rupert. Hi. Um, I know you have a strong theater background as well. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, do you prefer theater over film, or is there really not much of a difference for you? Uh, God, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I started off doing theatre. Um, I, I never thought I would ever do film or, or TV. I just never really kind of thought about it. And so it was a real surprise to me when I st was lucky enough to start doing it. And I, I, it took me a while to kind of calm down, you know, to go, oh, my God. You know, it was kind of crazy at the beginning because I, I, I just didn't realise, I just thought, I'm going to get found out. You know, I really did. I thought I was going to get found out for years. But and now... You were a theater actor? And yeah, I just a, thought, yeah. oh, they're going to tap me on the shoulder and go, come on, it's time to go home now. You can't do this. You come had on. a good run, kid. <laughs> had a good, go, back to, go back to theater, you know. So uh, it took me a while to kind of calm down. But yeah, but now I, 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 they're just very different. You know, in, in theater, I think you, you tell the story every night, you know, from beginning to end. It's a very different thing to a movie where... It's you know sometimes very technical and you're doing you know each moment throughout a series of weeks before the whole thing's put together. So it's just a different technique. And I don't think it's any better or worse, but it's just you know it's different. Sometimes in film it's great because you you know you get the chance to do the same scene over again and again, which is great because you can try and get it better and better. You know, whereas in theatre that moment's gone and you've got to wait till till tomorrow. You know, uh, but there's a freedom in theatre that I love. You know, it's just you on stage and. You can just show off and run around. So it's great. So there's, you know, it's, it's, there's pros and cons. Do you have a sweet spot in regards to the amount of times you do things over and over again on a film set? Are you like a two-take guy, a one-take guy, a five-take guy? <laughs> uh, it, very, it depends on, on the job, really. Uh, usually the first one is, 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 a, is a promising one because you think, oh, I've got another one, so I'll just do the first one. And then... If if they allow me to do you know a, a, like one more if if, we, if the director goes okay I think we've got it we've got it and I say to them C -c just let me just do one more you sometimes that one works as well whereas there's a sense of freedom because you know you feel like the director's got it but then you can do something different you know what I mean I try and do something different on every take right. I try oh really something different every take you yeah, don't try I, I to try because then it gives them they a have choice options. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, next question hi Rupert hi um, as a seasoned actor when that's you so kind of, I'm so not <laughs> but that's really kind of you um, when you watch movies now especially ones that your colleagues are in are yeah. you able to immerse yourself fully in the story or do you see it as more <laughs> of a performance and it's harder for you to separate the actor that's a good question I would apply the same question to when you watch yourself on screen as well well I hate watching myself I try not to watch anything I've done for at least six months because I can remember every single take and I can remember every moment and I get like, why did I do that? And I, I get over, you know, analytical and I, I, I really try. There's some stuff I've never actually seen that I've done. So I try not to watch it. And if I have to watch it, then I'll wait a good, good length of time. Um, when I see, f you know, if I know mates, you know, we, you know, I know friends and, you know, when I watch their movies and stuff, I tend to find that if it's, if it's, if it's a good story, and it's a believable character, and I like the story, and I'm, then I, I get, 
I, I you know I seem to kind of get uh, I kind of get involved. Then I don't think about you know the actor, the friend, or you know the director or what they're doing because I kind of just get drawn into the story. But if the film's not great, then that's when I tend to find myself kind of like you know going. What do they do? Oh, I see they're using a steady cam and oh why? You know what I mean? I start to kind of think in those terms. So if it's a good movie, I think uh, we all just get carried away in the movie, don't we? You know, we just don't don't think about anything but the story. Do you have a go-to compliment for when you see a movie that you don't really like that a friend is in? <laughs> <laughs> the lighting was great. <laughs> you seem like you had such a good time doing that. <laughs> huh? Everyone looked like they had a great time on set. On no one else one. could have done that but you. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, there was something. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, we think we have time for one more question. Right here, last question. Hi, uh, I was wondering what you thought of the Amazon pilot experience. Normally, people don't get to see a show before it's picked up, so I was wondering if that made you nervous at all, or if it, you were confident that of the quality of the show. Yeah, I, I don't know if you know. I don't know if you all know. This is, you know, we we did the pilot for Man in the High Castle, and then they they did like four or five pilots on Amazon, and then they uh, they 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 put those up, and people could watch all these pilots, and then they were allowed to uh, vote. For, the, for your favorite pilot. And then from that, uh, the executives at Amazon then decided which ones would get picked up. So it was kind of like, I don't know, it was like The Voice or something. Can it's you like see how X many- X Factor or something weird. It was kind of weird where you were kind of, you know, you, know, you were uh, being pitched against other pilots. It was kind of bizarre. Can you see how many votes are coming no. in? Oh, okay. No. Oh, okay. So you weren't uh, going back and like you you <laughs> can't they won't they won't tell you how many people have watched it and, but they had I, I think they have like a huge amount of, of data on you know how many people watched it did they turn off halfway through did they watch it all the way through did they come back to it you know the age group so I think they have a huge amount of information and they obviously and also you you were asked to vote at the end of it and you were allowed to give comments so you could see people's comments I think um, so you know we were all just kind of holding our breaths hoping that we would get picked up and we were fortunate to, to get, you know, get picked up. Um, but it's kind of a weird system. But I think the way that the television is now moving, you know, nowadays they don't make what I call the mid-range movie. You know, they make the, the $100 million hundred million dollar movie and they make the indie movie for a couple of million dollars. But they, that sort of mid-range movie doesn't really, you know, it's not as big as it was. And I think that's been replaced now by these television seasons. You know, by STX, the, also the uh, company yeah. behind The Boy, they are actually trying to get into the mid-range movie. I, I mean, think you're right. Part yeah. of the, uh, the big story about them a couple weeks ago, or the one in The New Yorker, was them yeah. essentially saying that they have found that there is not a studio in the mid-range market right now, and they yeah. want to be that studio. And The Boy, The Gift... And I, I and hope those mid-range movies comes back, and I think The Boy is one of those movies, certainly, and I think STX are doing a really, really great job. But I think television writing has, has vastly improved. Also... Um, actors, film actors, it's not seen as a bad thing now doing television, as we know. We see, you know, Dustin Hoffman, whoever, you know, doing TV. So there's a crossover. So I think the way we're watching television and the type of television there is, the writing, the type of actors that are in it, it allows us to, you know, I think there's a huge crossover. And I think the way that the young, you know, we're all watching TV now. I don't know about you guys, but I very rarely sit down and watch, you know, a show every night, you know, sort of Monday night, nine o'clock, I, I, I will binge. I will watch two or three in one go. And then, you know, if I'm busy, then I'll come back to it, you know, a week later and then watch another four or five. So I think, and I think that's the way television's going. It's, you know, we want to watch it when we want to watch it. And I think Amazon um, and others uh, have really tapped into that. And I think it seems like that's the kind of way it's going, no? It's weird you know to think I mean? back to a time where we would change moods every night of the week. Where we'd be like, Monday night at 10, I'm going to watch the, the, the drama show, yeah, and then yeah. Tuesday night, I'm going to watch the comedies. And for me, it's like, I want a week of Breaking Bad. I'm just going to be yeah. that intense for one week. That's what I want there. Yeah. yeah. You know, or well, one week of Kimmy Schmidt, where I'm just going to be light and happy around everybody for a week. No, you're, you're right. I mean, I, 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 my first big box set was The West Wing, which I, I bought on DVD, because in those days, you couldn't, you know, it wasn't streaming. And I, that was my, you know, my first big binge. And I just remember just watching, you know, I was just like, why? And you were intensely verbose for three weeks <laughs> yeah. around everybody. <laughs> I used to go around quoting it, you know. Yeah. Have you seen? Yeah. So I, I think it's just the way it's changing. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing, you know. I, 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 yeah, I just, uh, we'll see. But I think, you know, some, some shows, I think people did watch Downton Abbey every, every week, didn't they? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so I think there are some shows that, that still will survive, but it just seems that the way the world works and our, 
through social media and you know how we're living our lives, it seems that we're all over the place and we want to be able to watch it, you know, an episode of The Man in the High Castle, you know, on a Monday morning or a Monday evening. Which you should. It's a yes. great show. Rup and you should also see The Boy, which comes out. Yeah, I please believe. watch The Boy. Tw uh, 20, uh, 22nd. 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 22nd of January out in theaters so uh, throughout, throughout the U.S. So yeah. uh, thanks, guys. Thanks Congratulations, for Congratulations, Rupert, on all your success. Thank you so much.